Hello there. Welcome back to Interesting and Sexy, a podcast dedicated to spreading the awareness and visibility of intersex people, as well as discussing issues slash experiences about queer life, being different, and all other things interesting and sexy. Thank you for coming back. Um, Your support means the world to me, and those of you that are really enjoying it, it it's so great for me to hear whether it's for informational purposes entertainment value or whether you just like listening to the sound of my voice which i'm sure there are some of you out there those of you who want me to do asmr um i'm just kidding your support really really means a lot to me and um yeah you watching this uh and continuing to watch this allows me to keep doing this and um i really you know it means a lot. So thank you very much. Um, if you want to continue supporting the show, liking, commenting, sharing, that will help me out so much. And also if you would like to donate, there is a donation link in the description down below. Thank you very much. Today's guest is Molly McGlynn, and she is a director and writer from America. And she has this incredible film coming out that when I saw the trailer for it, I was like, it was like watching my teenage life in front of my eyes (laughs) in a trailer and i was thinking oh my god where was this when i was 17 like uh this is so necessary molly is changing the world and it is going to be beautiful and powerful and i'm super excited and i can't wait to introduce you to her so i'm gonna let her talk about the movie and her and everything like that so um yeah thank you again for watching and uh let me just introduce you to the exquisite Molly McLean. Welcome, Molly. Thank you very much for coming on. It's so nice to have you. Thank you so much, Bloom, for having me in your vibey <laughs> living room or studio, wherever you are. It's like a, a love half it. studio, half living room. <laughs> just moved into a new apartment okay. and it's like all in one. <laughs> I just watched a YouTube about your move. Oh, you did? Oh, the vlog? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love the vlog. Like, it's just so less chaotic than TikTok, which like yeah. has its perks. But there's something just really nice about a YouTube vlog. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Just doing something a bit more long form and less hectic. Yeah, I really enjoy making the vlogs as well. I hope I hope I stick around and keep making them. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my first question on this show is always, um, who are you? So who is Molly? What is Molly about? And how do you identify? Oh, my goodness. What existential questions. <laughs> I, the second you said, who are you? I was like, oh, <laughs> gaping into the void. Um, I, I guess in the very... Um, practical sense. My name is Molly McGlynn. I am a writer and director. I live in Los Angeles now, but um, from a big Irish Catholic family, I'm the youngest of five girls and they were all born in Ireland. And then my family moved to Montreal where I was born. And then I grew up in New Jersey and then moved back to Canada for university and started my career there. So, you know, I don't know where home is, but, um, I'm always like a Canadian girl at heart. Mm -hmm. I say that Ireland's like my sort of emotional, spiritual home. And then LA is the home I made for myself, um, as an adult sort of without any family or relationship. Um, so it feels special Mm -hmm. for that reason. Mm -hmm. And I forget the other question. So that's who am I? Who are you? What am I? What are you about? (laughs) I am about radical authenticity. I am about living in the gray area of life and identity. Mm -hmm. I am about getting comfortable with not knowing as I sort of get older. Mm -hmm. And I'm about hanging out with um, my little Yorkie Sweet Pea. And Sweet Pea. Sweet Pea and two little kittens we adopted called Thelma and Louise. And um, I live with my partner, Zach, and going to get married next year, which is uh, scary and weird. And I'm perpetually feeling like I'm sort of a child putting on adult business clothes, Mm -hmm. you know, trying Mm -hmm. to like perform adulthood. But um, he's he's an awesome partner. So Mm -hmm. I'm excited about that. Awesome. 
And the last one is how do you identify? I identify as a Somali, you know, um, I know I, I just sort of, it, it's funny. I, I we'll get into it. I'm sure I just, um, uh, made a film called fitting in, which is based on my, um, experience being born with MRKH. So I was born female and, um, I identify as female, uh, for sure, but, uh, through the process of writing the film and making the film and sort of understanding more what intersex is, mm -hmm. um, I'm still sort of exploring my relationship to that word and, and how it relates to me and how I identify. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have had people, you know, consider me as intersex and that's fine with me. I've had people staunchly say no and it's like okay like however anyone else wants to identify me is just sort of a projection of their own classifications and mm -hmm. um I just I don't know it, it's still an evolving process mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah I completely understand that and and people do love to debate it you know <laughs> people they love do. to debate so much <laughs> They do. I think, um, you know, especially with the MRKH community, there's some sort of bickering back and forth about, you know, I, I can see maybe not being as understanding or inclusive of people who have MRKH and identify as intersex. And mm -hmm. that really bumps me out because I feel like I have gone through a lot of shame and stigma and I'm part of this community of people with MRKH and I, it just makes me sad when people um, further stigmatize people who are like themselves and have known what it's like to walk through the world feeling differently. So yeah, my version and my understanding of MRKH includes many types of people and you know, some people who are, you know, cis hetero women or non-binary or yeah. intersex or yeah. trans or whatever, you yeah. know, so the more the merrier in my boat. Yeah. Um, would you like to explain a little bit about MRKH and uh, mm -hmm. how that works? Because from my understanding, it's not too dissimilar to androgen insensitivity um yeah like it, it when I was especially watching the trailer I was like oh I'm watching a trailer for my teenage life right now <laughs> yeah so um yeah there's a lot of similarities between us but it's completely different conditions so yeah yeah a lot of similarities I think um particularly it is often diagnosed um you know when it depends, but when you wouldn't get your period and that sort of prompts the beginning of this, but MRKH stands for Meyer Rokitansky Kuster Hauser syndrome, mm -hmm. which is named after the four male doctors who uh, discovered, and I put that in quotes, this condition. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, a reproductive condition that affects reproductive organs. So that means that in my case, I was born without a uterus, a cervix, and a shortened vaginal canal. So there's two types of MRKH. Uh, there's MRKH1 and 2. Mm -hmm. um, the second type can also come with, um, there can be uh, kidney issues, a missing kidney, some spinal issues, or can be hearing loss. Mm -hmm. um, so there's sort of a whole range of it. But I discovered it when I was 16 hadn't gotten my period went to the doctor and the the horror mm -hmm. <laughs> ensues mm -hmm. um so yeah it's uh I think they say every 5,000 births but again like these numbers are just sort of a ballpark yeah um I don't really know the accuracy of how they're reported globally mm -hmm. um so I think it's probably a lot more common than is reported mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah. people with MRKH have XX chromosomes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we get into the film, which I really want to get into, I'm so excited to get into it. I just want to talk about your journey um, as a writer and a filmmaker and and yeah. how you decided that this is what you want to do with your life. Um, 
I was always a bit of a weirdo kid. I um, was really drawn to um, art and music. And a lot of that was sort of like culturally fostered in me from my mom. And I think like Irish culture is like, you know, value storytelling and music and community and all of that. Um, I used to sign my diaries and say, here's my signature because it'll be worth lots of money when I'm a famous actress, but <laughs> soon found out that I had pretty bad stage fright oh, and was quite gosh. shy. So dabbled in some, you know, high school and community theater, but I think that I always felt different. And it's funny, like the, the shyness was before the MRKH diagnosis, which then further prompted me to sort of wanting to collapse onto myself and not really have the confidence to put myself out there. And um, I studied film in university and um, thought I was, I actually had gotten into a master's program in Dublin and was thinking about going into like um, curatorial studies and museum uh, research and all of that. But um, my mom died when I was 21, right after I graduated uni. So I stayed in Toronto instead of um, going to Ireland and started making short films and wrote a feature, which is called um, Mary Goes Round. It was my first feature film about a substance abuse counselor who's a closeted alcoholic and mm. dealing with an estranged father. And um, it sounds really morbid and awful, but there's a lot of levity and humor in it, which I also apply to um, my second feature, which is called Fitting In, um, about loosely based on my experience being diagnosed with MRKH. Um, I also direct a lot of TV for kind of my day job, nice. um, which I love. But I, you know, I think about something my grandfather used to say, he said, knock on any front door and you'll find a bestseller. Mm -hmm. And some are short little novellas and some are these grand epics. So I've always had a curiosity about others and our experience in the world. And mm. at the heart, it's when I think about it through, especially my work as a filmmaker, I reveal the sort of darkest, scariest parts of myself in an attempt to be seen. Mm. Um, and to do that through, you know, presenting it to an audience and trying to make a career financially out of it is kind of like risky business and mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily advise that, but um, there, there is a drive to feel understood um, and also to make other people feel seen. That is really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, perspectives that we haven't seen um, matter to me, whose point of view it is. Um, and, you know, even though it's just film and TV, this is how we see humanity. It can provoke us to think differently about ourselves, about the world around us. Mm -hmm. And to have empathy, especially now, um, I think is crucial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I'm getting goosebumps with you talking about that. And you're doing it so well, because just even looking at when I first saw that trailer for fitting in just so many people in the comments saying like, I have MRKH and like, Oh my God, this is, this is everything I needed. And like all the intersex people saying, Oh my gosh, I feel so seen. And right. even me just, I was like, where was this when I was a teenager? <laughs> where was this fucking movie? And I will say like, back to your point of like, when we were talking about, um, MRKH and intersex and, um, you know, like, even though let's say you are born with XY and I'm born with XX chromosomally, like the reason I was like, oh, I don't think about it that often because for some, like the physical experience of going through dilating is a very shared experience. So to me, it's when I'm thinking about intersex as maybe an emotional, physiologically, physiological or medical experience, mm -hmm. there's a lot more commonalities. So mm -hmm. yeah. that made me really think about intersex differently. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There are conditions that, um, 
yeah, are being debated whether or not they feel or that they feel they fit into the intersex category. But um, the the history of the medical experiences and the trauma and everything yeah. that you have to go through kind of unites everyone under the intersex umbrella that it's like, okay, we're the people that get this kind of stuff and have been through this kind of stuff. Um, exactly. If you get it, you get it. Yeah. And it doesn't matter, you know, what's, what the terminology is or the chromosomal makeup. However, I will say, um, I think with some people with MRKH, there's a feeling that they're an aspect of their uh, femininity has been taken away. Yeah. And I think it's kind of reactive to that loss. So even when people are are sort of anxious about it or nervous, you know, it's just, it, it's because there was a loss there, mm. but what I always want to encourage people to think about is if, if someone with MRKH is also intersex, their identity doesn't take anything away from you. Mm -hmm. It's not going to give you back things that you feel like you are stripped of. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's almost like this, this perceived threat, which is, which is false because mm -hmm nothing that anybody says is going to take away from anything we want to define ourselves as. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. And, and, and just seeing the similarities of um, like MRKH and like androgen insensitivity as well. Like I know a lot of uh, complete androgen insensitivity people, they feel like they are completely female and that they Mm -hmm. that they are no less female than everyone else, which is true, yeah. you know? So it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's this, yeah, it's, it's complicated, but being under the umbrella, I know for me personally has bought me so much peace <laughs> and so much um, time to just reflect and be connected with people who shared the experiences that I've been through. I love that. I love thinking about it as a way to bring you peace. Um, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and okay, so let's get into the movie because <laughs> I've been so excited to talk to you about it. Um, first of all, I guess you kind of already explained the question, your motivation behind it, but you can elaborate. I'm guessing it's because you wanted to feel seen and have others, others feel seen or what? what was the initial thing that sparked that idea? You're like, I'm going to do it. I think because I'm a filmmaker and I have this sort of unique experience in the world, mm -hmm. it seems like, okay, I have to share this. Yeah. Um, and it can be an opportunity to create a film that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. um, it's the first film in which MRKH is the subject. Um, which is incredible, but it also comes uh, with a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. I'm very adamant that people know that this is one experience with MRKH. I am a, you know, a white woman in the medical space yeah. in New Jersey is yeah. very different than um, experiences that people will have around the world with, you know, there can be cultural or religious um, connotations or yeah. um, people of color. So I'm just want to make it clear that I can't speak for everybody's experiences. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, even I kind of felt a little pulled back and forth with people getting nervous that I'm uh, insinuating that MRKH is intersex. When people see the film, I think they'll realize the only thing I do through the character is, is ask questions. Mm -hmm. I don't come to any conclusions. The character Lindy is played beautifully by Maddie Ziegler. Mm -hmm. At no point does she say, I am, you know, like a cis hetero XX female. She's not, you know, running around saying she's intersex. It's like watching someone figure out this 
tangled mess. And the character is 16. 16 year olds, from my experience, do not have all the answers. Right. They are um, actively trying to just sort through the rubble. And totally. that's what I'm showing. I'm showing more of the mess and I am answers. And again, my my film is not a conclusion to what is MRKH, what is intersex, where do I fit in? What makes a woman? What makes a man? Is it biology? Is it functionality? Is it, you know, an expression? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, the film also um, is like commercially appealing as well. I think there is a version of going through this experience at 16 that could kind of be a little trauma porn-esque or euphoria-like. Mm -hmm. And I, no shade to euphoria, I wanted to also show joy. Yeah. Um, there's an intersex character and actor played by Kai Griffin, who's um, based in the UK, who is incredible and joyful and acts as kind of like a beacon of light to uh, Lindy played by Maddie. Nice. And it was important for me to see that joy um, and not live in just the pain and the trauma of it because there's so much more. Mm. Um, so yeah, like there's a lot of humor. Um, and when the trailer came out a few weeks ago on, on Facebook, I saw a mom of someone with MRKH say that they were kind of like nervous about the tone of the trailer because like it, it's not funny and it's not what sh this mother saw her daughter go through and um I completely understand that and I responded to her and I just said you know let me just clarify nothing about this was funny yeah. at the time nor yeah. do I think it's funny now yeah. yeah there are there are funny moments in the sense that it's absurd yeah. because bodies absurd yeah 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 but having a freaking medical dildo like when you're 16 and just like mm -hmm. horrified by this yeah. um is absurd and funny and uh that's what I think bodies are yeah. and of course I'm only able to see this through time and perspective yeah but in no way shape or form am I trying to minimize the emotional impact, which is very, very real. Mm. I also wanted people who may not necessarily seek out a film with this subject matter to feel pulled into it because yeah. they like how it looks or the story. And yeah. Maddie has, you know, a like a huge following of people who yeah. are going to be able to access something that they maybe never heard of or thought about. So yeah. the film starts sort of like typical coming of age teen sex story yeah. and she's got this gorgeous boyfriend that she she wants to have sex with and yeah. so you think you it's like okay I've seen this before and then when the diagnosis comes the whole world is is flipped upside down and so is the subject matter of the film yeah, it's so oh. it's like a bait switch. <laughs> I'm getting so excited like I just can't wait for it to come out it sounds so good <laughs> Me too. We have to get an Australian distributor to buy it and distribute it. But uh, it, we're we're working on other territories. The release right now is in North America, but um, people can find me on Instagram, and I will post any updates I have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be it would be perfect excuse to come out to Australia and do a little premiere here. <laughs> You're telling me, do you have any Australian distributor friends? Tell them to call me. <laughs> Potentially. I don't know. I mean, I can, I can suss it out. My, my cousin is a <laughs> filmmaker as well. Um, so maybe he might know someone and I'll get back to you on that because yeah, that, that sounds no very important, just... <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, it would, it, it sounds like it was, yeah, a lot of, because I also think that you can through time look back and say yeah that was like a little bit weird and absurd and and everything <laughs> that you just said and you can look back on it with a bit of uh lightheartedness um but that emotional impact is is so strong for all um people who are diagnosed with something like this uh especially in that tender age <laughs> it's it's just really full on and 
I just wanted to ask, what was it like for you trudging back up some of those old experiences and reliving them, so to speak, and then I guess seeing them in front of your eyes again? (laughs) It was wild. Like I'm still sort of processing it, but um, my therapist said to me last year, like, you just kind of did a very, done a very expensive form of exposure therapy, <laughs> which she was saying with previous PTSD um, patients, she did something where she'd have them record their story. And at first they weren't able to even hear it back. But the idea is you want to be able to finally listen to your story and sort of stay in your body. Mm-hmm. And the process of me doing the film was that to first of all like just casting Maddie was like an enormous leap of faith um to kind of trust someone with such delicate subject matter yeah I didn't want someone with MRKH to play the role because I didn't want to re-traumatize someone Mm -hmm. who has had an experience and to do it again on camera yeah yeah it just didn't sit well with me um she comes from a dance background. Uh, you know, she grew up on this reality show dance moms and she, for different reasons than I have had lives, has lived a very unusual life. Mm -hmm. I think she has felt, I won't speak for her, but she is someone that knows what it's like to push your body to its brink. Yeah. Sometime at a cost to yourself. Yeah. She can express things intensely without saying a word Mm -hmm. because she's a dancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so much of that experience in the early, early days of being diagnosed and going through dilating and all of that, it's beyond words. Mm -hmm. You're only 16. How are you going to explain this? So I needed a performer who could express so much really through their eyes. Um, Mm -hmm. And it, we had an amazing intimacy coordinator and it was so crucial because there were, was someone who basically works as an, um, a mediator between myself, let's say, and Maddie before she's doing a dilating scene. So, yeah. Um, and what's great about it is even though I'm, I was an open book to Maddie, I told her she has access to anything she wants to know about me or MRKH that can, you know, it's like people, feel like they are intimidated or there's things they can't ask you. So if she had questions about what it feels like to have a dilator inserted, you know, Mm -hmm. she could ask that through the intimacy coordinator and they, and the intimacy coordinator could call me and be like, you know what, because I haven't gone through this, like, how would you describe it? And so Mm. then I describe it and it's relayed in a way that, um, everyone kind of feels safe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It was important to me that at no point in the process, I put her in a position where she felt uncomfortable or exposed or traumatized in any way, because I am not going to use my pain and trauma Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to put it onto someone else Mm -hmm. and then benefit from it creatively, financially, however. So, you know, Like truly, it it was protecting her experience over anything more than it was kind of getting what I needed. But there was just a bit of a synchronicity um, with her and I, and I was blown away. But there was one scene, um, we only had like 10 minutes left in the day to shoot it before the, you know, lights were unplugged basically. And Mm -hmm. it was one of the first dilating scenes and it was a close up on her face. And so for me, the approach was always, this is not about the mechanics of the process. It's about the emotion. Yeah. And it's this close reaction shot on her face. And it's so crucial to convey what this feels like. Mm -hmm. The first take was kind of weren't quite there. And I was like, Oh my God, I only have a few minutes to get this. And I went over to her and she's standing in front of a crew, you know, on a bed with this dilator. And of course she's not actually doing it, but I I said, like, think about a time where you wanted your body to do something so badly dancing and you could not. And she, without saying anything, just nodded. And I shot the second take and it, my whole body had goosebumps (laughs) because 
it is no longer mine. It's like ours. The oh. experience of feeling like your body has failed you in some way is not specific to people with our MRKH or intersex. Maybe we feel it more acutely, but like there is more of a universal experience here with being a human with a body that was tapped into in that moment. And that freed me from a lifetime of shame and stigma because it was beyond myself. Wow. <laughs> I'm getting teary just listening mm-hmm. to you talk about that. That is so powerful. Yeah. It, it, like I still can feel myself sort of get choked up when I talk about it. And, um, that's why I'm just like, I will protect Maddie at all costs. Like I, she's just like just a bad bitch. Like it's not an easy role to play and to just come prepared and be like, all right, let's, let's do it. Like just to give yourself fully to that level of vulnerability is like not something everyone can do. And mad respect. (laughs) Wow. And did you, did you have her in mind for the role or how did you find her to, to play the role? Someone, um, at, uh, WME, my agency, uh, it's a big, like reps, a lot of people. Um, we were starting to put lists together and someone said, what about Maddie? And I, to be honest, and I've told her this, I was like, she's like so beautiful and perfect, you know, like all these Instagram followers and fashion spawn sponsored stuff. And the agent said, you know, just meet with her. I think she'll be maybe surprising. And I said, okay. And so we met for coffee and she had like wet hair and Converse and ordered a cookie, which I found like really (laughs) unexpected. Like you kind of think it's going to be like a green juice or something. And, uh, at the time was, I think 18, but wholly in her body and uh, just like a soul. And, you know, when do we need, when will we learn the lesson that people aren't necessarily what we see on the internet? You know, it's like, there's just such a a veneer and um, we're all guilty of it, myself included. Um, So I'm really glad uh, they had suggested I meet with her. Mm, Nice. And Mm -hmm. um, you've got like a few other stars in your cast that uh yeah. just watching the trailer they all look like they are really doing a great job um yeah and Emily sorry go ahead yeah so it, um the the actress that plays um the main character's mom I know her from Shit's Creek and I yeah. love her in Shit's Creek but yeah seeing her in this role which is completely different um it makes me excited to watch her in that is that who you were going to talk about is her name Emily yeah I, Emily Hampshire she's yeah. uh incredible and um a lot of people know her from Shit's Creek she is a very brilliant comedic performer um and I think it's really uh exciting to put comedic performers in roles that can require more drama or emotional intensity because uh a lot of comedy is 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 pain right so if you understand comedy you understand drama Mm -hmm. um and I think it was an interesting tension to have someone like Maddie who is not from a comedy background Mm -hmm. the tension between a mother who is like that and has this sort of chaotic ex- explosive energy mm-hmm. creates like natural tension between a teenager and their parent you yeah. know when you're just like oh, like this yeah and you just want your parent to be normal um yeah so yeah she was incredible and like Kai Griffin who I mentioned uh from the UK their first feature film role uh incredible I found them on Instagram I was adamant we cast an intersex actor in that role we were not having any luck with casting directors which is a whole other thing with casting it's not that intersex actors are not there Mm -hmm. there is not they don't have representation Mm -hmm. or are potentially working actors who are intersex who don't feel comfortable disclosing that nor do they do it's absolutely none of anyone's business so I understand um, but I, I ended up p- posting something on Instagram and Kai did a hand waving emoji yeah. and I looked at their page and the character Jax that Kai plays is 
got a je ne sais quoi swag sex appeal yeah cool factor yeah and like I was like this is it oh. but Instagram as we know lies so I was yeah. like okay put do the scene on tape and I got it and I was like okay this is it yeah. like <laughs> I would not have shot the movie without finding Kai um oh. and Maddie's love interest in the film primarily there's a few but uh Deferro Wunatai um he is an indigenous actor who was just nominated I think today for a Critics Choice Award. He's in an FX show called Reservation Dogs, which is like a groundbreaking indigenous comedy that oh. people should watch. Um, I think he's like on his way to be an enormous um, star. Nice. And and did you find everyone's chemistry works really well together? Because it looks that way from the trailer. Absolutely. Um, and I would be remiss not to mention um, Maddie's best friend in the film is played by Juliet Amara, who's on an Apple show starring Chris O'Dowd. I directed a couple episodes of that, but it was prior to shooting Fitting In and, you know, we, we had Maddie and I'm like, oh, I need her best friend. And the best friend was someone who is intimidatingly cool and beautiful and beautiful mm -hmm. to create that tension and I'm like oh my god like we have Maddie Ziegler so who is this person yeah. and <laughs> Juliet uh was that and it, it's weird to cast separately best friends mm -hmm. and I'm like kind of just trusting my instinct mm -hmm. will create that yeah <laughs> now they are real life friends and oh. that makes me happy like I'm just like oh like I don't have children but like I have <laughs> movie movie babies you know like I'm yeah. putting together like a little family that I I want to take care of and mm -hmm. for me the process of making a film uh like I think it making films is very like traditionally like patriarchal and mm -hmm. intense and militaristic but I kind of wanted something a little bit more holistic and like feeling like we were making a community because it was more than it was more than just making a movie and people understood that and I had a lot of um sort of young guys in their 20s on the crew who just showed up with the time on the call sheet and probably had no idea what they were getting into but even seeing through the process of shooting I was like oh these these guys are thinking differently yeah. about something <laughs> about sex or um just maybe about yeah sexual uh negotiation and consent and all of that wow. so that was really cool. nice and was this disbanding after you had finished was that a really emotional thing oh yeah yeah I you like I cannot express how intense it is to make a movie physically creatively mentally um and I always crashed a little bit um and I think after the film premiered at South by Southwest in March and it's the first time people saw it and there was like a standing ovation and I just was sort of like out of my body and mm -hmm. um for me it's like an emotional hangover of not only the how arduous it is to make it but kind of the exhaustion of like a vulnerability crash where I feel like I've shared something about myself that like the toothpaste is out of the tube. I can't put it back in now. Mm. And, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say I had moments where I'm like, oh no, this feels too much. Like I, I want to kind of go back under the blanket and just be unknown in this way. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, like after the premiere, I, I met a young woman who was kind of shy and like hanging in the corner and I was like oh are you were you at the movie did you want to talk and she was like yeah and um I think she had like a developmental um disability um she didn't specify what but she was really emotional and she said she watched the movie and she thinks now that she can say that she's beautiful and that she's okay as she is and I burst into tears and so did she and like just this like deep moment of connection on the street with a stranger where I'm like this person has a different experience of feeling other in the world yeah. and whenever I get like 
kind of, you know, overly critical or unsure, I remind myself of her because truly if one person feels empowered to say that the way they are is perfect and beautiful, then like I did my job. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy for you that you got to have that experience and and are you getting lots of positive feedback from it? Like it, it must feel for crazy. sure. It's been like overwhelmingly positive. There's always like dipshits who write stupid stuff on the internet that <laughs> I mean, I don't need to tell you this. Like <laughs> you, you're um, a publicly facing person as well. And it used to like kind of bother me, but now it's just like, it's almost comical. Yeah. I'm like, what? some of it doesn't even make sense. Like, um, you know, there's like a comment of like, this, this looks like porn. Why? Like, you know, and it's like, what, you're the one sexualizing, like, a medical experience, so yeah. it's like, don't even get me started, so yeah. I don't engage, because uh, those people um, would never say it to your face, mm -hmm. and I hope that they find peace <laughs> with whatever is kind of um, disturbing their own peace, and ultimately, I think, uh, I'll take those hits if it makes a few people feel seen. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, how do I put this? What do you think young Molly would think of this movie if it was out? And what would young Molly think of knowing that you did that movie? <laughs> young Molly could not utter the words to those closest to her so the thought yeah that it would be this, this public thing would be unfathomable I don't think a younger version of myself could even wrap my head around a version of myself that would be okay with this wow yeah um, and I think I would I think younger me would say like thank you for being brave mm. um because, you know, it does take guts. It We're all, again, online and, and visible, but visibility does not mean we are vulnerable. Like there's a distinction there. And to be really vulnerable takes courage. It takes, it takes fucking guts. And I'm not going to downplay that. And um, with that comes backlash or things being said that are hurtful or not true. Um, but that's all out of my control. I would rather live a life that takes risks to create things that move a needle in terms of conversation or how people feel about themselves than be under the blanket watching Love Island, which mm -hmm. I was doing last night. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for everything that you've said. Like you've spoke so candidly and I'm loving getting an insight onto the film and your process behind it. Is there anything that you want to put out there for maybe someone who is either going through dilation or maybe someone with MRKH who is like feeling alone? Is there, is there a message that you want to give to those young people out there, those young mollies? <laughs> yes. And it's very much in the film, but the main thing, and I don't know if you're going to believe it, you don't have to believe it right now, but you need to tell yourself that you are not a problem to be fixed or solved. There is nothing wrong with you. And when doctors or people are talking about um, modes of treatment, I'm putting that in quotes, mm -hmm. such as using dilators, um, that can be on your own watch. You can do it tomorrow. You can do it in a year and you also can do it never. Like if that is the path you want to choose, I think I looking back was very angry that it was just, I internalized that I had to be fixed. I was giving, I was given dilators and it was like, okay, here you go. I didn't even know what kind of sex I wanted to be having or with whom. So it's also really presuming like a heteronormative 
um, identity, which yeah. again, I, I just uh, find problematic. Um, but you have to, to be in control. And I also like, I've spoken to a lot of parents of people with MRKH. And like, the one thing I say is like, your kid will, will guide you. Mm -hmm. You don't guide them. Like you, you don't get to say what they should or shouldn't be doing. So mm -hmm. I would just suggest that there's no rush and you also don't have to do anything. Yeah. Thank you. And, and where can everybody find you as well? I'm at Molly Mary McGlynn on Instagram. I post um, film updates, pictures of my cats. Um, and I, I hope people see the film in North America. Mm -hmm. um, I get a lot of messages of when is it coming here or here or here. Mm -hmm. As soon as I know, I will post it. All right. Awesome. And what's the official release date? February? February 2nd in Canada and the US. Perfect. February 2nd. I can't wait. I mean, it's going to be longer for me, but I mean, I can't wait to hear about what everyone else thinks of it. But thank you so much, yeah. Molly. I loved having you on. Thank you so much, Bloom. Love the, the vibey atmosphere and great questions. And I'm happy to make a new friend. Yeah, me too.